morning. Oh, am I on? Ooh, hello, there we go. Yeah, now I'm on. And welcome. Welcome to worship this day. It is a beautiful day. One of my favorite kind of days. The temperature isn't above 70 when I get up in the morning. I like that. Uh, just a few announcements. We're going to have a brief ad board meeting right after church. Won't take too long, but stick around if you're part of the ad board so we can do that. Um, and don't forget to be in prayer for our students, our teachers, our staff, our bus drivers, our whoever works with the schools here in Hitchcock and Tulare because school starts tomorrow. And uh, everybody's real excited about that, right? Who knows? They'll survive, right? Anyway, so uh, school starts tomorrow here in Hitchcock and Tulare. We have a youth group meeting coming up on the 17th. It'll be a parents' night, so parents are invited to come also. And we're going to have something to eat, pizza or something. Probably pizza. Probably pizza. Ray will be baking pizzas. No. What do you mean? What do you mean spinning? Yeah. <laughs> Calling up. Ordering pizzas. Uh, but come. That'll start at 6 o'clock. And uh, I want to invite everybody that's part of that to be there. We do have the Family Camp movie coming up for this, uh, this next Sunday, the 21st, at 6 o'clock. Still have tickets available, and uh, just get a hold of me if you don't want to go to the online thing that they have in the, uh, on the insert there. But if, if you're not, not, a, no, not afraid of the internet, you can go on there and do it. It's pretty painless. I, I did it, and I'm still alive. So. But anyway, if you do want tickets and you don't want to do that, just let me know and we'll mark you down and get your tickets taken care of for you. Um, any other announcements? What did I skip? Oh, United Methodist Women's coming up too next, next week, Wednesday. A week from this coming Wednesday. And that's at 6.30, so be sure to mark that on your calendar. That's when they're going to talk about the mission trip and what they did and didn't do and what they should and shouldn't do. And who knows what all. They'll always have fun. So. Uh, other announcements? Birthdays or anniversaries? What? We have one day that doesn't have any? Oh, Jeff's getting his phone on and he's looking up a couple birthdays. You never know. All right. Well, let's uh, let's then take ourselves. Oh, 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 oh. Denise. <laughs> <laughs> See, he he knew he knew there was something. All right, Denise, you almost got away. I almost. Well, if you could have stolen his phone, you were a pop pick pocket. You might have had a chance, but whatever. We better sing. We better sing to Denise. Happy. What is it? Uh, God's blessings. It's what wants us to say. God's blessings to you.
the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and what it is like. We'll take ourselves up to the opening prayer with Alleluia.
So my bag got left in Aberdeen, but it's okay because she planned ahead, didn't you? Yeah. And she said, this is something I can keep. <gasps> oh, oh boy. Wow. Green beans. Yeah. Nothing wrong with having a bag of green beans. Wow. Did you pick these? Oh, Grandma got them for you. Well, isn't Grandma nice? You snapped all of them? Wow. That is a lot of work. Thank you. Did you help too? Thank you. And thank you, Grandma. <laughs> Did Grandpa help at all? Yes. Oh, okay. We don't want to leave Grandpa out too. Yeah, we don't want to skip Grandpa if he helped. Yeah, do you like green beans? Oh, good. I like them too. I have one daughter that hates them. She does. She would go hungry rather than eat green beans. I don't understand it. And, and her husband, he loves green beans. He makes green beans a lot. She doesn't eat them. She eats everything but the green beans. When you grow up, you can do that. When you're a kid, you have to do what mom and dad tell you, and you have to eat green beans even if you don't like them. But it's better if you like them, isn't it? Yeah. And I think they're good. I like them a lot. And I'm going to eat those. Thank you. Those will go right in my refrigerator and they'll probably get cooked today. Some of them anyhow. It's nice, you know, that we have these kinds of things. Uh, and, and right now, too, the sweet corn is, is getting really good. Some, as Alan says, his is almost done. <laughs> and, and Lisa said theirs is just ready, just getting ready. So, yeah, a lot of sweet corn, a lot of that kind of stuff, a lot of good fresh stuff. It comes from God's earth. And you know, that is such a blessing. And we're so lucky to live out here where we can see where our food comes from. You know, there are a lot of people in, this, in, the, in our country that don't have any idea where green beans come from. If you ask them, they'll say the grocery store. Well, where else? Well, I don't know. Warehouse, probably. They don't know that these can grow. You can grow these right in your own yard, can't you? Yeah. You don't have to have a farm. You can grow green beans right in the backyard. You can grow sweet corn back there too, but it, you can't grow enough to make it worth the trouble. Yeah, you are. And that's a good thing because that means that you understand that our food comes from God. Because God is the one that helps those things to grow. There's a, a passage in the Bible that talks about that. It says, you know, we plant the seed and we can water it and we can fertilize and we can do all of that kind of stuff, but we can't make the seed grow. We can only give it the right conditions so it can grow. You know who makes it grow? God. He does. God, it says, gives the growth. And that's a good thing for us to know because all of these things, green beans, sweet corn, beef, pork, lamb, chickens, all of that stuff, eggs, those all come from God helping us and giving us food to eat and giving us a job to take care of the place where the food grows because that's important too. You know, we got to take care of the garden, keep the weeds out, right? Yeah, we can't have weeds in there because that makes it hard for the good stuff to grow. So we've got to clean it out. Yeah, you've got to work hard. Yeah, got to work hard and do all of that. But when we do that work, we're rewarded with a wonderful treat, a wonderful gift. The gift of green beans or sweet corn or of a good steak or a, a piece of ham or whatever. You know, we've got those things that God has given us. And God loves us. That's why he gave us all those things. He said... We can eat the produce, the things that we grow. And he helps us to do that. And he helps all of us to grow too. 
not just to grow like to grow food, but to grow strong and tall and healthy. And uh, this is how we do it, with good food and the right amounts. So I get to keep these. I get to keep these. I'm putting them back in this bag so they go home with me. I'll share, though. Anybody wants to come over for green beans later, we'll... There's not a lot, but we'll share. Anyway, it's good to know that God gives us so much wonderful stuff because of his love for us. That's one of the ways we can tell how much God loves us is the way he provides the food that we need to eat. Always remember that God does love you no matter what. Let's pray. Thank you so much, God, for watching over us, for keeping us safe, and especially for giving us food. Food to grow and strengthen our bodies, food to make us happy, food to make us smile. Thank you, Lord, for giving us all that we need and so much more. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I don't have a bag to send home. Do you want to do the bag next week? Okay. We had it up at your house. Yeah, try to remember the bag. You can use this bag, okay? All right. Then there's a reminder. Well, in one church I was in, the bag disappeared and it didn't show up for like six months. And then it showed up and there was something weird in it, so that's the way that goes. Today the first scripture is from Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. The next scripture is from John chapter 6, the first 14 verses. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, for he had already in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And the last reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Thank you, Sherry. Appreciate your reading. There's still a couple of uh, spots open on the reading list if you do want to read scripture. It's out there on the table in the entry, so take, take a look at that as you head off today. So we're back into our, our series, tra tra Kingdom Treasure. There we go. Get my mouth working the right way. Kingdom Treasure. And this, uh, this Sunday, if I turn my clicker on, I can move it ahead and say we're going to be looking at a little can be a lot. 
And I think you can kind of see that in the readings that we just had of Scripture. So we're glad that you're here today and glad that you're listening to this. And we're going we're gonna to continue in the series. This last week we talked about the kingdom of God being like a treasure that someone found in a field and went and sold everything they had so they could have that treasure. Whether it was gold coins or diamonds or whatever it was, it doesn't say. It just says a treasure that this person was so excited about. They sold everything they had so that they could have that treasure. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. We're able to give whatever so that we can receive the treasure that God has for us. So today we're going to talk about how little things mean a lot. Um, I make chili. I like to make chili. We had six kids. I always made chili for about 20 people or 30. I don't know. And I haven't gotten any better at portion control now that there's just the two of us at home. And so I have this giant stock pot and I start pouring things in and stirring it up and mixing it up and pretty soon I've got chili. Well, one day I couldn't find the one thing that I always like to add to it, and that's this Rotel mild uh, diced tomatoes, green chilies. It's got a little spice to it, but it isn't real strong. So I grabbed another one. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I thought, well, you know, habanero, is that, is that hot? I don't know says hot, but how hot could it be? And it's only a little can. I mean, good grief, the can's only this big, and my pot is like this. And so I thought, I should be fine. So I dumped it in, stirred it up, and had a bowl. <laughs> okay, it was slightly exaggerated, but it was way hotter than I wanted. And um, I kept adding to that pot of chili and adding to it until it was like right up to the top with tomato sauce and other things to try to take some of the spice out of it. And it was still really hot. And for me, that's really hot. And for my wife, it, she probably would have been like that if she'd have tried it the first time. Little things, just a little bit of that habanero chili in there. And there's worse ones than that. So just a little bit can alter the taste of this giant pot of chili. And then I, I read the passage that uh, we had in, in Matthew. He says, he told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast that a woman took and mixed into 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. It's an interesting passage because this is the only passage in scripture where yeast is not used as a warning. You know, other places Jesus says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware of the yeast the things that can come in and can destroy and alter and, and make things bad. Here he's talking about how that's, you need yeast to make the dough. So you've got 60 pounds. That's a 60 pound bag of flour. I was gonna get a 60 pound bag of flour, but then I thought, what would I do with it? I'd have to throw it away because I would never, at our house, never use 60 pounds of flour. And I looked, I looked up, because I have no idea, I don't bake. I looked up how much, how much yeast you would need to use for 60 pounds. And they said, on average, a little bit less than three tablespoons. Okay, so 60 pounds, three tablespoons. That's that little tiny thing over there. That's a, a tablespoon of yeast. Three of those one of those. It doesn't take much. But without it, it's not any good. It doesn't do what you want it to do. It doesn't rise. You don't have the, the nice loaf that's, you know, not flatbread. I mean, you can still eat the stuff, but it's better that way. A little goes a long way. And that goes not just for food, but it goes for people. Little goes a long way. There's a, there's a story of this guy. You probably never heard of him. George Mueller. Mueller. I couldn't get the umlauts over the U. I don't know how to do that on my computer. But he wasn't German. 
Well, he probably was way back, but he was living in England. He was a, a preacher back in the 1800s, and he had come to England to be a missionary. He was going to go on a missionary journey, and they decided he couldn't go because he got sick, and they said, oh, you're not healthy enough. And, and he tried to get a different appointment, and they wouldn't give him a different job, so he quit and started doing his own thing, found a church to preach in, was preaching. He's an interesting guy. Uh, when he was growing up, his father was pretty wealthy, and he wanted to make sure that George had a good life. So he was going to have him go to seminary. He thought to be a preacher would be a good life for him. It's stable, and it's pretty, you know, fairly lucrative. You can make some money and have a safe, stable life. But George had other ideas, because even when he was young, he was stealing from his father, who was a government tax collector. He would steal the money and use it to go buy alcohol and to gamble. So he got off into college and kept doing that, got through college just barely, and then went off to seminary. Well, he didn't change. He continued to drink and to smoke and to gamble. And one day he came to the realization that he had to change his ways and he got down on his knees and prayed that God would forgive him for all of his past sins and continue to guide his life. And from that day on he never smoked or drank or gambled again. And he continued to preach and taught and saw in his area a need for an orphanage. So he and his wife found a large home and set it up so that they could foster 30 girls in their home. That's how he started. But he didn't just set up an orphanage and just have a place for them to live because these were children of the lower economic status. He decided that he would get them training and education and so he did that. He got them training to be for the, for the gals cooks and maids and parlor maids and things like that. He got them trained so that they would be able to rise above their poor beginnings. And he went from there to, by the time he had died, he had uh, taken care of over 10,000 orphans through him and his wife and the orphanage system he set up. And the most unique thing about George Mueller is he never once asked anybody for money. He never put out, he never did a financial statement, he never did a, a giving campaign, he just depended on God to supply his needs. There's a story that in the early days they were sitting at the table for breakfast, he and his wife and these 30 girls, and they had empty plates because there was no food in the house. There's a knock on the door and it's the local baker who has all of these buns and rolls and, and good things to eat and donates them all so their plates are full shortly after he leaves there's another knock on the door and the milkman is outside and he said my milk cart is broken down and by the time they get here to get a new wheel and we get it fixed the milk's all going to go bad so can you use all the milk I have and the milk came in and they had breakfast George never in his career of serving over 10,000 orphans asked anyone for money he just prayed and pr trusted in God but he started, he started just as one flawed individual and took care of over 10,000 orphans in the 1800s when workhouses and uh, debtors' prisons were a normal and constant thing. They were given a place so that they could grow and thrive and become better. Little things. It doesn't take a lot for little things to matter. Well, then we have the most famous story of little things in all of Scripture. This is a, a unique passage because it's one of the very few that are in all four of the Gospels. This happens to be John's account of it. But it's a familiar story. They're at a place and there are all of these people who've come to listen to Jesus. And it's, you know, um, a nice afternoon and it's wearing off into the evening and most of the people have been there all day and one of the disciples comes and says you gotta send these people away so they can find food because there's no food here we don't have any we have no way to feed them 
send them away. And Jesus said, no, you feed them. But we don't have food. Didn't you hear? We don't have any food. And even if we did, even if we could buy food, we don't have enough money. We're, we don't have money. We don't have food. We don't have anything. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, shows amazing trust. He says, well, here's a young boy, and he's got some food, enough for a young boy's lunch, a couple of fish, a few loaves of bread, loaves of bread, probably little tiny things. And he brought that. He brought it to, to Andrew, and Andrew brought it to Jesus. And Jesus says, have everybody sit down. It's time to eat. And he gives thanks and he starts handing out the food and he hands out the food and he hands out the food and he keeps handing out the food. And, you know, it's, it's one of my favorite passages when they get to that part about, uh, where does it say that? When they had all had enough to eat. Enough. Not when they'd all had a bite to eat. Not when they'd all had a little snack. But when they'd had enough to eat, Jesus said to the disciples, all right, now, go pick up the leftovers. From this to that. 5,000 men. The other scriptures say plus women and children. So, you know, let's take just a wild guess and say there were 5,000 women and children. Jesus just fed 10,000 people with that. Just a little thing. Just enough for a, you know, a small 8, 10, 12 year old boy to have for a lunch. Get him through the day, get him to the evening meal and he'd be all right. And it ended up with all of those 10,000 or more people satisfied enough to eat and a basket for each one of the disciples. And I think the basket for each one of the disciples was just a reminder to say, guys, this is the kingdom of heaven. We don't need to worry about what we don't have. Remember what we do have. We've got Jesus. We've got the Lord with us. Leftovers, leftovers. Kingdom power is what made the difference and what makes the difference. It's not just about the physical things we have. It's about who we have. There's a story that was... Uh, in a book that uh, one of my authors quoted about a, a dad and his son that were out exploring one day. And they were exploring all these different places and they found some, some rocky cliffs and mountains and hills and they were climbing around in those and having a pretty good time. And all of a sudden the little boy hollers to his dad, catch me! And the dad looks up and the kid has just jumped off of a cliff and the dad, you know, makes like a sprinter and runs over and catches the little guy and they fall to the ground and dad is puffing and panting because dad's a little out of shape and shouldn't be running and finally he gets his breath and he said what why did you think that that was a good thing to do why did you think that I could catch you and the little boy looked at him and said because you're my dad he trusted he trusted fully that it didn't matter he could jump off of anything his dad would catch him Sadly, we don't all have that kind of trust, but that's the kind of trust that is important for us to understand because, you know, somebody's jumping through the air and God's there to catch us. Sometimes that's the way we feel. We're like suspended because we've taken that leap of faith, that jump of trust. We've decided to give it all to God and God will catch us. God will support us. God will hold us up. So, you know, it's not about the big things. It's about little stuff, like a sack lunch. A sack lunch that a little guy shares with 10,000 people, and people eat and they have leftovers. They have food to take home with them, and the disciples pick up 12 baskets of pieces that just fell to the ground, probably. People didn't even worry about it. Or yeast, where we put a little tiny bit into a lot of flour to make the bread that we want to have to live. Little things make a difference. 
It isn't always about the big and spectacular when it comes to God. God does big and spectacular things. I mean, when he parted the Red Sea, that was pretty big and spectacular. The ten plagues in, in Egypt were pretty big and spectacular. But that's not always how God works. In fact, more often than not, God works in the simple and the mundane. God works in the forgotten people and in the small amounts and the trust that we have to go ahead and give all for him. That's part of that kingdom of God that's coming. That's part of the kingdom of God that comes before us. So we need to remember that we should never underestimate God. You know, that's, a, that's something that we need to know as individuals. We also need to know it as a church. God calls us to do something, and we look at it, and we say, you know, that's a great idea, God, but... And then we have all the answers of why we can't. Well, but we don't have enough people. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough young people. We don't have enough people who know how to do that. We don't have enough of this and of that and of this and of that. And God says, you've got me. What more do you need? What more do we need? I had a friend once that said, you know, if, if it's something that you want to do, then you need to have all of those pieces in place. But if it's something God wants you to do, all you need to do is trust God. Because God will always call you to do things that you don't think you can do. Because if you think you can do it, then why would you need God? But if you don't think you can do it, you need God. That's the only way it's going to work. So don't underestimate God. Don't sell God short. God will bring whatever is needed to the situation so that it can succeed. This last passage in Corinthians, it, it's um, kind of towards the end as he's wrapping things up. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of God because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I think that's important for us to remember. That what we do for God, even though it may seem small and insignificant, it might seem like three tablespoons of yeast or a sack lunch among 10,000 people. It might seem just ridiculous to even offer it. But God will always honor our offering. God will always honor when we are working for his kingdom and giving what we have. See, God doesn't expect you to give what you don't have. God doesn't expect you to have all the answers. The only answer God's interested in is, yes, I'll do that, God. That's the answer that God needs to hear. So, offer your limited resources to God and watch him use you to help change the world. Think about how Christ started out with 12 men. Fishermen, tax collector, carpenters, one troublemaker, one traitor. And with those 12 that were soon to become 11 and then back to 12, Christ changed the world. He wasn't calling these 12 because of what they had. He was calling them because they were willing to go and to give themselves fully to the work of God through Jesus Christ. Now, it didn't hurt if they had some skills and talents, but that's not why God called them. Because in God's kingdom, a little can do a lot. Remember, nothing is impossible with God. I always remember that when I look in my office and I have a camel with the needle right up here on his little halter. You know, 
It's easier for a rich man to get into heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And the disciples are in a panic and they say, how can that be? That's impossible. And Jesus said, yeah, with people that's impossible, but not with God. No, not with God. Nothing, nothing is impossible with God. If God's in it, there's nothing that'll stand against it. So be sure that you're willing to trust and give all you have to God so that you can be part of his kingdom and help others to become a part of that kingdom and do what God has called you to do in that kingdom. Amen. And amen. Next week we're going to look at a similar topic, but we're going to look at God grows things, you know, like green beans and faithful disciples and all of us. So we'll take a look at that next week as we grow things with God. So it's time for us to take a look at our prayers, which is one of our ways of responding to God's word in our life. We have our prayer list up there. Don't forget to take a look at that list and see all the people that are on it. Uh, A lot of the names are familiar. We've seen them before. We have uh, a bouquet here from Ray Christensen's, excuse me, Celebration of Life service. Uh, That was just last week, Thursday. And uh, yeah, it was Thursday. Was it Tuesday? Thursday. Tuesday. (sighs) All last week was kind of a blur for me. I imagine it's worse for you guys. Yeah, so we have the flowers here to, to honor him. Uh, we also want to keep uh, little John Coleman in our prayers. He's still in the ICU. Maybe we'll get to come home this week, so be in prayer for him. And, of course, all of the other folks we have listed up there. And we want to add to that our uh, students and teachers, staff at the school, including the bus drivers and the custodians and the, everybody, everybody that's involved in the school, pray for our school board and all of the people that are a part of educating the young people here in the Hitchcock and Tulare area and all around. We know that there are folks that watch us from other areas. Uh, and I don't know where everybody's school starts, but that one I know because they're right across the street. And last week I saw a whole herd of cars there. So the teachers were all getting their marching orders or something, I don't know. But uh, be in prayer for them too as that school system starts up and school starts all over for everybody in, uh, in that age group of being in school. Any other prayers? Okay, 106 of the Gilbert bunch and 12 of the 13 kids. What a blessing that is. Yeah, I Ray said, they were here forever too. He said, I drove by at six and they were all still here. And then I saw later and then they went over to, to Susan's house and we're all over there. And yeah, I said, well, they, they have fun when they get together, right? That's a good thing. Not a lot of families do that anymore and that's a wonderful blessing. So yeah. I'm glad the church was able to host you here so you'd have enough room for all of them. Because otherwise, they'd have had to have it in several houses and, or a big tent. Yeah. Any others that we want to lift up today? Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, sing our prayer song, Glorify Thy Name, as we go into a time of prayer. Oh. 
take a time of silent prayer as we lift our own personal prayers before the Lord this day. Let's go to Him in prayer. Gracious God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as we gather today, we are mindful of how small and insignificant we really are compared to you. When we think that we have the answers, that we can do what needs to be done, you must smile. But hopefully you smile as an indulgent parent that understands that we're still learning, that we're still growing, and that we will learn to fully trust in you as time goes on. Help us to put our trust in you, the one that we can trust, because you are our Father, and you love us. And as your kingdom comes on this earth, help us to understand that it will be different it will be yours, not the world's. So let us see glimpses and traces. Let us be part of the glimpses and the traces. And as we come into this part of your kingdom, we lift up prayers. Prayers for the people on our prayer list, those that are dealing with illnesses, those that are dealing with heartaches, those that are dealing with loss, those that are dealing with all of the struggles of life. We thank you for being with them and strengthening them. We also lift up prayers for our schools as, as they begin here in Hitchcock and Tulare, and I know in many other schools around the area, if not tomorrow, very soon. We'll be starting and going again, and our children will be back in school, and the teachers will be there ready to teach and to guide and direct. The administrators and the staff will be there to make sure that the teachers have a good and safe environment to teach in. And so we pray for all of that. We, we ask you, Lord, to just put your blessing over all of the school systems that we're a part of, anyone that we know someone is a part of, whether it's, it's uh, elementary school or high school or college or trade school or wherever it is. Lord, be with those young people as they begin another year of learning, training, education. Strengthen them. Give them wisdom. Give them courage to stand for what they know is correct and right. Help them to know how to discern that. We also uh, lift up a prayer of joy for the, the Gilbert reunion that gathered here at our church yesterday with uh, 12 of the original 13 of the family and 106 various and sundry relatives to come together and celebrate and laugh and eat and enjoy one another. What a blessing it is when families come together in joy. And what a blessing it is when we, as your family, the family of God, come together, come together in joy to hear about you, to sing to you, and to lift prayers before you. We enjoy that blessing, and we give you thanks for it as we pray together the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. We also respond to God's word in our life by bringing our morning tithe and offerings. Our ushers would come and wait on us. We would do just that at this time.
Almighty God, our, our Savior, our Protector, our Guide, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to return to you a portion of the many blessings that you give us. We ask now that you bless these gifts and those that have given them. Let each one find their place and purpose in your kingdom as it comes on this earth. But we pray that today in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. Well, if you would join me in our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie that Binds. It binds us all together as followers of Jesus Christ.